Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Health Tech with Purpose. Today we have Brandon Feeney joining us on our show. Brandon is a healthcare VC and partner at Providence Ventures, a strategic venture capital firm focused on digital health, tech-enabled healthcare services and medtech. Join us on this exciting episode where Brandon's insight provide a roadmap for health tech companies looking to navigate the complex journey for product market fit to sustainable growth. Hi, Brandon. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Yes, uh, it's a pleasure, in fact, because we represent the interest of a lot of health tech companies. And uh, I believe they are all looking forward to get some great takeaways from this episode. So it's our pleasure. Thank you so much for joining. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, Brendan, uh, let's start a bit about your background. If you would, um, you know, you have been working uh, in different positions and different roles that you have had. Um, would you like to share a bit about your journey before uh, Providence Ventures and we'll then come uh, to Providence Ventures? Right. Yeah, I mean, my it's... My my journey has, uh, I think, taken taken a windy road. I, I don't think, I don't think I have kind of a traditional investor background. At least how I started out. I, I come from a healthcare family, so I was actually always in the in the sciences and and technology, and that's what I ended up studying in college. I did research in organic chemistry and got a degree in mathematics uh, and I w with an eye towards actually becoming a practitioner in medicine. Um, and, you know, when I was in college, so this, this was qu quite some time ago, but in college, when I started to get actually involved in the healthcare world in practice, like volunteering at hospitals, going on medical kind of mission trips to actually get, get hands-on clinical experience with, with doctors um, and getting to know what their daily life was like and mm -hmm. a first-hand look into the healthcare system, at least within the U.S. I honestly, I became uh, rather disillusioned with, with what a lot of providers have to go through now versus what, you know, maybe 30 or 40 years ago. Um, there's a lot of downward pressure on, on economics and pricing, um, on autonomy uh, there's a there's a, a lot of new kind of corporate entrance in medicine that has made it hard for independent doctors to, I think, have the voice and, and the authority that they used to have. And so I became disillusioned with with that phenomenon, um, despite my continued interest in healthcare in general and a desire to make change in healthcare. But I realized that, you know, perhaps becoming a a provider of medicine wasn't the most effective way, at least for me, in, in making an impact in this industry that that I had a lot of deep interest and passion in. And so I I started kind of exploring different strategies and, and entrance points into healthcare with trying to answer the question, how do I how, how do I make an impact here? And how do I do something that that is sustainable and scalable, meaning it can impact, you know, you know, thousands or even millions of lives. And so I came across venture capital um, and innovation in general. Uh, venture capital is something that I now have been in for, you know, for well over a decade. But initially, I had no interest in business or finance. Um, really, I was trying to find a vehicle or strategy that could help me achieve my, you know, more mission driven goals within healthcare. And I found that healthcare venture capital was really just an effective vehicle and, and not a silver bullet to all of healthcare's problems, of course, but an effective vehicle for certain um, for certain strategies that were trying to make a scalable impact mm -hmm. in healthcare, because really you're just creating companies. Right. You're locking arms with founders and, and other investors to, to take a shot um, with some resources and know-how and network. Right. Um, to, to do something new, whether it's a, an entirely new category on the riskier end, or maybe it's a, an existing category, an existing sector, and you're, you found a new way uh, to, to solve an existing problem. Um, what, you know, whatever, what, whatever the exact uh, archetype is, all you're doing is trying to, to fund and build ideas that could potentially make impact on millions of patients' lives. And that's really what 
attracted me to this space because of just my genesis as a person. Um, and so I, I, I started out at, at a place called Sandbox Industries and have found my way to now Providence Ventures. And I can, you know, I, I can, I'm happy to give you more detail on our strategy, but that's, that's really what brought me here is really a healthcare first, finance second uh, mentality and journey. Okay, very interesting. I mean, that's so unique because, uh, uh, you know, it's hard to find a person, uh, you know, in venture capital, but, uh, uh, you know, with a cause like yours where, uh, you know, you you have had finance taking a, a back seat and, uh, uh, you know, like basically bringing your mission, uh, you know, at the forefront where you want it to be. So that's very interesting. And I, I can guess probably uh, founders uh, may uh, get some empathy from you with the way you described, you know, about creating an impact and changing livelihood as the most important goal. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And it's always, it's, um, and this actually mirrors a discussion around when you look at the different venture capital strategies out there, there's the strategic investing versus financial investing and everything in between. And, uh, you know, for me, that mirrors my kind of personal spectrum in my head of like, am I an impact investor or am I a financial investor? And for me, it's like, you know, a lot of times, maybe most of the time that those aren't mutually exclusive things. I mean, we're not we're not an impact fund. We're, we're, we're paid and measured off of financial returns. But because we've chosen healthcare as a sector, everything we invest in has an impact on caregivers' lives, on patients' lives, um, you know, name your healthcare stakeholder, even though we're, 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 we are driving towards uh, generating a venture class return, um, none of our 28 companies don't have a mission aspect to it because it's healthcare. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So uh, tell us more about uh, the thesis of Providence Ventures. Uh, uh, you know, of course, it's the one of the largest names uh, for health founders, uh, but in your own words, um, uh, you know, what is the thesis of Providence Ventures and what makes it stand out and a choice for healthcare founders? And who would be the right fit? Because that's important to understand who should uh, be looking at raising, uh, being a part of uh, Providence Ventures and who should be avoiding it if there is anything like that. Right. So, so um, I'll, I'll give you the checklist version first, so it's clear kind of what we do and who we look for, um, and then overlay the kind of differentiable strategy that that we've used to, I think, drive outsized returns and, and win the best deals. Um, but on kind of a surface, kind of a superficial level, we're a venture capital firm that focuses on healthcare companies, uh, private healthcare companies mostly those that are in kind of the digital health or tech enabled services universe. Um, so basically any company that's using technology to address the top priorities for a variety of healthcare stakeholders, uh, mainly providers and payers, uh, self-insured employers, and even pharma are kind of the four customer markets that we tend to look at most. And these companies are commercial stage, so we're not seed stage investors. They, they're generating revenue. Uh, they have uh, at least emerging product market fit. Um, and then they will we'll enter companies that go all the way up to maybe 20 or 30 million of annual revenue that are kind of approaching the growth equity zone. Um, so if, if I were to put it in numbers, our comfort zone are companies doing maybe three or so of annual revenue, 3 million of annual revenue a year, all the way up to 20 to 30. But that's not a hard mandate. We've gone earlier than that, and we've also gone later than that. Most of them are unprofitable when we first invest, and we are investing a minimum of five million uh, initially, up to ten or so million initially in businesses. And we 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 tend to lead or at least co-lead our rounds, and we'll take board seats. So that that's that's kind of the general profile of, of tactically how we operate. Um, but you know, taking a step back the investor market is very crowded. I mean, we'll, I'm sure we'll get into this in the, in the conversation, but you know, the amount of dry powder and just available capital to be deployed into private companies, 
that that volume is at historic highs right now. And so it's a very crowded market um, and there aren't a lot of high quality companies or high quality assets. And so you have kind of a supply demand mismatch um, where it's it, it creates two things. One, it keeps you know valuations uh, rich and frothy, even in a, a market that's been reset since COVID. And we can talk about that. But the second dynamic is uh, it's very competitive. It's very, very hard to, you know, first you have to find the comp the best company, you know, that's part one. Um, but part two is convincing them to take your money. It's, right. it's a very, very hard dynamic of trying to win the best deal at the terms mm -hmm. that are rational um, mm -hmm. and putting enough money to work. And mm -hmm. so we, we recognize that wholeheartedly. And I, you know, it, looking at my personal history, I've experienced that now for, for over a decade of just how hard that part of the job and the, the, you know, capital deployment strategy is. And so what we've done is we, we've, we've built ourselves upon a, what I call a strategic platform. I mean, we started out as a, 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 a lone LP model with, with Providence as our anchor LP, you know, to date we've managed two funds on their behalf, 300 million collectively. And Providence um, is not a financial LP. They are one of the largest, most diversified stakeholders in the healthcare ecosystem. And so by deploying capital on their behalf and being more or less integrated in that organization, we as investors have had this kind of unfair information and customer access advantage um, to, to get a kind of on the floor look on not, not only where the market's going, but what customers want and what the determinants are for a, not just successful adoption, you know, just not, not, not just winning a contract, um, and getting adopted in the market, but also understanding the, the, the nuances of a sales cycle and an adoption cycle. So it's one thing to win a customer contract and to sell your solution. It's another thing to actually over time reduce the time it takes for your solution to get adopted. Because in healthcare, these sales cycles and adoption cycles are notoriously complex and notoriously long-winded. And so many cooks are in the kitchen and it's very hard. Uh, you could have the best product in the world that's differentiated, that's, that's actually effectuating hard ROI. Um, and all of that is, is, is uh, evidence backed. But if you if you're not selling to the right stakeholder, right. Um, if you're not selling to the right organization, let alone the right individual within the right organization, mm -hmm. your solution either won't get adopted or, or the adoption cycle will be slow. And so having that that nuanced understanding of of the of the stakeholder dynamics, uh, the the budgets and the priorities and the incentives of all of these, like I said, kind of cooks in the kitchen, that that will make or break. Uh, a company that is otherwise uh, remarkable in its technology right, and its right. in, its in, in its own innovation. And so for us, what we've done, uh, you know, to your question around what our investment thesis and strategy is, is we have leveraged our relationship with uh, with Providence um, and use that as a kind of a cornerstone for our for for our network with other integrated delivery networks, other health systems to build this strategic platform and network where, we're helping the best companies right. map to the right stakeholder that actually has yeah. the budget and the priorities that 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 actually map to those businesses. And the end result is uh, reducing the adoption cycle. And so, you know, to to talk, you know, more tangibly about that. I mean, we, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've invested in twenty eight companies. All of them have partnered with with a, a an organization we've introduced them to and that we've helped navigate, and that includes Providence. And so mm -hmm. that type of customer access and adoption cycle reduction is really what we emphasize. And that's one of our key metrics of, of success and something that will continue. Right, right. No, makes sense. Especially we all know how hard and uh, different it is to build a successful health company like this. You have to uh, be prepared for the long game, basically. So health right. is like... Uh, uh, an e-commerce or a typical, you know, just launch and, uh, you know, do it. But it's like you have to be ready, like waging war on five fronts. <laughs> right. And I, I think right. uh, the VCs that are in this space have to 
uh, follow the same because the VC money, I think, uh, would take a longer tenure to come back if you are invested in health. So, uh, you know, one of the things that stands out, which, uh, you know, you mentioned as well as, uh, you know, is uh, like uh, pretty much right, um, you know, in the definition of Providence Ventures that uh, uh, you guys are a strategic venture capital firm. So, uh, like, can you define the term a bit more uh, clearly, uh, uh, you know, oh. like uh, what exactly it means? And again, probably what it does not mean if uh, there's anything like that. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's actually more more a, a a question with more complexity than one would initially think. Um, we actually, so we we would we we pride ourselves in being a strategic investor, um, which we actually believe is distinct from a corporate venture capital investor, um, and a, I, I'd say like a you know corporate VC is perhaps a subset of strategic investing, but there are other forms. And so for us, what, what strategic investing means is you are, you are trying to deliver two forms of returns in a way, you know, you're, 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 you're delivering financial returns by, by selling businesses and returning that capital to your LPs, but you're also trying to invest in businesses that are relevant to the, the strategic priorities of your LPs. And that's a that 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 goal that that second goal of strategic alignment that in itself comes in many different flavors, many different forms, and, and we can talk about kind of the different um, archetypes that that I've seen in the market. But for us, what we're trying to do is is uh, we've kind of drawn a line in the sand where we are going to be measured and compensated off of financial returns. So that's our primary goal. Um, but we also emphasize the importance of providing access for our companies to our LP base. And so what that means is we want, at the end of the day, what we want is we want a majority of our portfolio companies to be working with our LP base in some in some way. It might not mean all of them are working with our LP base, but but I, I think a majority has to in order to signal to the market uh, not just that we're a strategic investor, but more like, why is that even important? What, why be a strategic investor? I think it all comes down to, um, that's how you differentiate yourself in a very crowded market and trying to win the best deals. How, how do you look entrepreneurs in the eye and say, hey, we're, we're, we're more than just money. We're not gonna just sit on your cap table. A super specialization, you... yeah. Yeah, and... yeah, it, it's specialization. And it's all, it, also, it also is hard evidence that you can actually give them something that actually helps grow their business mm -hmm. more than just funding. And by, by maintaining that, that emphasis on strategic alignment, um, mm -hmm. we're able to do that for companies. I think that that's the reason. Um, on the flip side, like we also have to raise money ourselves. You know, we have to raise funds and we have to recruit um, limited partners to, to, to be the lifeblood of what we do. Right. And we also want to differentiate for them. So it's not just for the entrepreneurs, but also for the LPs. There's tons of funds out there. Why do they invest in us? Yeah, we have we have good financial returns, but a, there are a lot of funds that have good financial returns. We need to differentiate ourselves by more than just that you know singular dimension. And that strategic alignment is is kind of how we do it. And that's what we've that's what we've done for Providence for the past decade. So. Mm -hmm. um, but ha but happy to double click on any of that. I, I know it's a uh, th there are a lot of different flavors of strategic investing. Right, right. No, to that. And uh, do you see uh, such strategic uh, investors uh, in other domains as well? Like we know in health, like uh, you know, you have been one of the uh, great examples of strategic investment. Have you seen? like uh, such strategic venture capital firms uh, in other domains as well? Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the, the easiest example, uh, there are three domains that come to mind. Uh, I mean, Google. Google has, you know, Google Ventures. And, and so you'll, you'll have uh, Microsoft has M12, uh, M12 Ventures. So in technology, you'll, you'll see corporate venture capital. Uh, you'll see it in financial services and insurance, like Prudential has proven capital. And then my the first firm I was a part of, Sandbox, they're um, 
they one of their main strategies is healthcare, and that's how I got started, as I mentioned. But they also have a fund uh, called the Cultivian Fund that does investing in agricultural technology. And so I, I think uh, that's kind of a long, long list of examples to, to, to paint this picture that corporate venture capital, I think, is everywhere. Um, and when you, when you the, the question is why, what, why is corporate venture capital even a thing within these, these larger corporations? Um, there, are diff- there are different goals for these corporations. I mean, you have maybe three or four strategies that I've seen that, that, that the, all of these strategies fall into one of these four buckets. One is like you invest in these early stage assets um, with an eye towards potentially acquiring it later on. Right. So yes. it's kind of a low risk way mm-hmm. to enter into a strategy. And in a way you're kind of outsourcing R and D uh, mm-hmm. via, via venture capital investing. Um, so, and by the time you acquire the asset, if you do, you're you're not acquiring the whole thing. You've already you know purchased a portion of the company earlier right. on when the price right. was lower. So it's right. it's a way. And probably of already costs. have some sort of uh, terms built in for a ceiling. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, and you you you've had time, whether it's two, three, four, five years, you've had time to see the asset mature because you were an earlier investor. Um, so you're kind of doing diligence for mm-hmm. that period of time as opposed to seeing it for the first time wanting to acquire it. So that's that's probably a primary strategy that a lot of other industries have used, not just healthcare. Um, one, one that's more common within healthcare, especially from these emerging kind of health system venture arms, is uh, maybe, maybe you invest not with an eye towards acquiring it, but you invest to strengthen an, ex- an existing partnership you have with that company. So a lot of these health systems will will, will work with a vendor, a third party, and their venture arm will invest in a third party to strengthen mm-hmm. the commercial relationship and to help the health system benefit from the value that itself creates by paying this vendor. You know, you're paying them in, in that's their revenue. If you own a piece of the company, that that's value back to you as well as an mm-hmm. investor. Right, right. This episode of Health Tech with Purpose podcast is brought to you by MindBowser, a product engineering and digital transformation company focused on health. At MindBowser, we enable health companies to build the future of health where accessible, equitable, and patient care. We strongly believe that technology can empower a healthier world. And that's why we are partnering with healthcare experts like yours to make it happen. Hi guys, thanks for listening to Health Tech with Purpose. Make sure to subscribe us on Spotify, Apple, and YouTube for more expert insights on industry innovation and transformation. And remember, share the knowledge. True. So uh, let me touch upon uh, two, I would say, most uh, frequently asked questions um, from any venture sure. uh, partner today. One, where is the market now? So what should we be reading in the market? Is it like... Uh, um, you know, already hit the most difficult phase. Now it's going to get back to the easy phase or it's going to get more difficult or where are we headed? Second, um, with equal priority, what are we really thinking about AI? Uh, <laughs> so to, to hit your first question, um, I think that there are, two, there are two ways to help answer that. One, you know, you can look at just, current current tr- trends and signs that we've seen in the market to kind of help us paint paint the picture that you're trying to paint. And I'll get to that. But the second and kind of more easy one is just to look at past economic cycles. So mm-hmm. when you look at the uh, the dot, you know, the dot com bubble burst in, in 2001, and then again, the the, uh, you know, the, 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 the recession in 2008, and you look at the the not just the stock market, but the private funding market and the M&A market, which is more relevant to us. And you look at just valuations. Um, they follow a pretty predictable trend. Uh, so so to kind of put it, what, what that means for us now is some of the, the best performing funds, you know, VC and private equity funds are those that uh, started. Um, started investing about a year after the economic trough 
So, you know, if the, if the dot com bubble burst was 2001, the 2002 vintages had the best returns. In 2008, that recession, the 2009 2010 funds had the best returns. And the reason for that is because prices are low and people are scared. And so it's an opportunity to, right. to in, invest in, in high quality assets that are actually right. reasonably priced. And so we're kind of in that time period right now. I mean, we, I know whether or not we actually had a recession is under question. It's a little unclear, but, but, we, but, what, but what is clear is we had a market reset you know, in 2022, um, and it's still kind of going on. Um, and and you had a lot, you've had a lot of economic uncertainty. And so right now is is kind of a great time to invest and start a fund because prices are more rational, you know, valuations of businesses are more rational. And we've, you know, a leading indicator of that, that's very easy to point to is just the public market, the, uh, you know, the multiples and prices for digital health, along with every other sector, dropped precipitously starting in the beginning of 2022 and that trend has uh you know it's stabilized a little bit but prices are nowhere near what they used to be you know at the height of covid and so um that's a long way of, say, of kind of answering your question on where are we at today where we're at today is you know say what you want about uh when will the public markets reopen or when will the m a markets reopen it's hard to predict the exact timing of that of that but what is clear what the data suggests is right now is a, is a great time to invest because prices are being rationalized right. and um, ultimately when you look at the the um just the fundamentals of why an asset is attractive forget the valuation um for a minute, it's all about what needs are they serving? Is the need that this solution is addressing, are these needs high? Are they widespread? Are these needs going to remain and even grow in the in the long term? And for a lot of digital health companies, or at least digital health categories, uh, the answer is yes. Like they're trying to decrease costs and increase access. And um, these are, these are needs and desires of the healthcare industry at large. Um, and, and it's kind of always been that way. So I don't, I don't see the need for a lot of these companies going away. It's just going to be a, a question of who's going to do it most effectively. And that's who you obviously want to invest in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, it makes sense. And we call it also call it the efficiency wave. So basically it's all about right. building efficiency within you know, whatever is already there and, you know, creating value out of uh, um, the bottom line, if I may say. Right. So uh, the the second part uh, or the second question uh, was about AI. So uh, AI. In the VC circles right. where you see it going. I mean, of course, I, I would think that you would be bombarded with AI based companies solving you know, like being the, I'd say the perennial solution uh, to everything that right. was a problem earlier. But, uh, and because, you know, as a VC, you have to find value that is still, uh, you know, kind of uh, in a way, uh, not apparent. You have to find those shiny stars. So somehow you have to also count on, uh, you know, the future, but then how do you assess those possibilities when it comes to AI? Yeah, I mean, the, so this this new kind of renewed interest in, in AI with generative AI now being so widespread and in the consumer's hands, um, there there's definitely a wave of companies coming our way. But I but I think we we evaluate it pretty much the the more or less the same as we do other companies, which is, you know, you can be. Uh, you can be AI, you can be machine learning, you can be, you know, you know, this this man behind the curtain doing it all and no technology. However, you're doing it, if it's leading to real results for the customer and delivering value, then we're interested. Mm -hmm. And if you're delivering value in a way that's differentiated and you're you're doing it better than the next guy. Um, and even better, not only are you doing it better uh, from the customer's perspective, but you're doing it more efficiently. So it's better, you know, unit economics for you as a company, then that, I mean, that's the, that's the winning combination. And that's something, if it's generative AI, that's, that's the main driver of that winning combination, then we're all in. 
Um, but what, what, what we've often run into, whether it's this new iteration of AI or former iterations of AI, we find companies that are, uh, you know, just overly engineered, you know, technology platforms that are looking for a problem versus the mm -hmm. other way around of let's mm -hmm. identify the problem first. Um, and then you build the optimal solution for that problem or problems. When you're just technology looking for a problem, is there a chance they'll find, you know, they'll, they'll find the problem and, and fix it? Yes, of course there is, but the risk is so high. And when you end up, when you're in that situation, we, you know, one of the common pitfalls is it becomes, I, I used this word earlier, overly engineered. You put, you pour all this money into it, into building the, the platform. And then you're also burning money along the way paying for the people and you're just burning operating capital while you land, while you try to find a customer or customers and try to grow the company. And then five or 10 or 15 years go by and you're, you're nowhere. Mm -hmm. So that type of profile is something that we would steer clear from. But if you're using AI to solve a, a current need and there are um, early signs that you're doing it well, um, and you're, it's, it's, you know, there's, there's clear differentiators and defensibility kind of characteristics, then that's something that we would get behind. Mm -hmm. So how much, uh, so like you said, just elaborating on that aspect, um, you know, one is like AI just enabling something. And the other aspect is, you know, AI being the deep tech behind the whole say solution or the value proposition. So would you say that uh, you're still more inclined in looking at whether the problem is getting solved or not, rather than whether there's a deep tech which has its own IP or, um, you know. Yeah, the, good question. Yeah, it's de it's definitely the former. Yeah, we're, you know, investing in just a deep tech solution that that is valued based off of its inherent technical IP. Um. You know, I, I, I don't know how successful strategy strategy that is in healthcare. You know, I can't speak for like the tech world because yeah. I know those those guys have a have a different kind of mindset right. and, and right. they have different adoption cycles right. and their customer markets are much different. But in healthcare, mm -hmm. I mean, at the end of the day, the, the primary customers you're selling to in healthcare, you're, you're not selling to patients most of the time. I know that they're oftentimes users and beneficiaries. But mm -hmm. you're 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 selling to enterprises, you know, selling to hospitals, mm -hmm. to payers, to um, you know, in the digital world, you know, you know, pharma's also making inroads. Mm -hmm. But these are enterprise customers that are risk averse, mm -hmm. you know, and they have tight budgets, with the exception of pharma, and that's a whole nother conversation. But when it comes to digital health, most often you're selling to hospitals or payers mm -hmm. or employers that are covering their employees. And uh, they're not making these big, most of the time, they're not making these big bets on like fancy technology platforms. Mm -hmm. They're making bets on things that are solving their business or clinical problems right. that have an ROI equation. Or if it's not ROI, maybe it's some other business objective like patient access or employee satisfaction and talent right. recruitment and retention. Like these are whatever, whatever it is. It's like a, it's, it's a clear business objective. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh... What about uh, mistakes that companies beyond Series A make? It would be very interesting to know because, uh, uh, you know, usually they say that, you know, finding first customer is tough uh, than finding 10 and then 100. So once health companies, especially that have a product market fit, where do they really fail, uh, Brandon? What is What has been your experience and what lessons companies can learn? Right. So I, I think for, for a business that has achieved product market fit, the natural imperative for them is, is to grow and to scale and to kind of replicate what they've done with, you know, the few customers that they have at that point. And um, I think the primary pitfall for a company as it, as it goes on that scaling path um, has to do with, with how much money you raise and how do you, de how do you deploy it? So there's a lot, there's a lot of question, there's kind of a lot of decision trees that go on in that. But I think over the overarching issue is companies will oftentimes just spend too much money after that point. So when you have a company that's achieved product market fit, 
Um, they'll go on to, you know, build a big sales force or they'll hire too many C-suite executives um, or they'll they'll pour all, all this money into R&D without clear business reasons as to why you're building, you know, product X, Y, or Z. Um, or on the sales and marketing front, it has been kind of founder-led sales up to that point. And so they've never built a sales force before. They don't know how to do it efficiently. They don't know that, uh, as, as one example, it doesn't matter how many quota carrying reps you have, if you don't have upstream lead generators actually providing qualified leads, um, nothing's going to get closed or processed. If you don't have a, a, you know, a great account management function, then your existing customer base will go on the wayside and either you'll experience churn or you, you, uh, you'll experience lack of customer expansion and same store growth, which is, you know, more efficient than new logos because you've already acquired the customers and takes usually takes lots of money to expand existing customers. Um, and so a lot of these kind of efficiency questions, um, I, I think, I think, come in the form of, of issues for companies that are trying to scale. Um, another thing kind of related to that is when, as you, as you go on to raise more and more money, um, you know, the key question is how much money do you raise? Uh, who do you raise from when you get closer to profitability or become profitable? Um, how much of that should come from equity investors versus debt, you know, term loans. And these are, these are all questions that our companies have to grapple with, uh, periodically as they get bigger. And so that that's another, I think, uh, one of the problems that comes from that is, is companies end up raising too much money. So if you're a uh, 10 or $20 million revenue business, revenue a year business, and you raise, you know, $100 million, well, you know, you only raise as much money that you need for the next couple of years or to get to profitability if that's within the next couple of years. If you're raising $100 million, then that means you're going to spend $100 million in 24 months. And the only the only way spending $100 million and burning through that money makes any sense is if you have the growth to support it. So here's, here, here's, here's some math for you. If you're burning, um, just to make it easy, if you're burning $10 million a year um, and you're a $10 million a year revenue company, but you're not growing, that's not good. If you're not growing, ten million dollars of burn a year is just you, you. You should be getting to profitability because that growth or that burn, that money burn, is not leading to growth, and that is completely inefficient. Versus, if you're burning twenty million dollars a year, but you're a twenty million dollar a year company growing to fifty, then growing to a hundred, that burn, even though it's greater than ten, um, that that's leading to new revenue, and that that's that is uh, that's justifiable and that would be that's the reason to burn money is because it's leading to growth. And so mm -hmm. I think for, for companies that are raising a lot of money, the only reason you should be doing that is if you have the growth to uh, to justify it. Um, mm -hmm. Trying to think of other uh, mistakes. I think hubris in general, hubris of CEOs, you know, as you <laughs> As you get as you get through the, the as you acquire one, five, ten customers, you eventually get to a point where you've exhausted the early adopters. You you start to enter into this segment of the market where there are no more early adopters. You have them all. Now you're entering customers that are more representative of the broader market, and um, you're kind of jazzed because you have these early adopters that you may not think are early adopters and you think they're representative of the entire market. And so you start, you know, you're, you, you start kind of not being honest with yourself when you're running into issues with customers. Is it the company's fault? Is it the customer's fault? Is this competitor really better than us? Or is this customer just, you know, they don't get it. They don't understand our model. We come across it all the time of companies. Once they get scaled, they'll make up excuses as to why they're not winning any more business. And they've kind of, tapped out on growth. It's because, you know, the market doesn't understand us or this, this customer is, is a problem. It's like, well, it doesn't matter what the reason is. You're not growing. So, and the only thing you can control is yourself. So maybe you need to look yourself in the mirror and make some changes. Right. Uh, right. Right. 
well said so uh, one um, question to expand on the idea that you just mentioned uh, brendan is uh, um, you know like what kind of ratios or any financial prudence that uh, you know you would look at on an quarterly or an ongoing basis just to make sure that um, just like you mentioned the maths that the maths is not going wrong um, you're talking about met metrics we use to to yeah. give us an idea of just capital efficiency, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so so t two metrics come to mind. I'll I'll start with I gave it I gave a math example earlier, which is like the amount you burn relative to growth. So a good metrics to look at good metric to look at is on an annual basis. Uh, how much money have you burned op like operating capital? You know, some people will use, you know, the, the, your EBITDA loss as a proxy for that. That's fine. So let's look at your EBITDA loss relative to not your overall revenue for the year, but your new revenue. Meaning if you made 20 million of revenue that year and last year's revenue was 10 million, then new mm -hmm. revenue is 10 million because that's how much you added. So we look at basically your burn relative to new revenue that that burn created. Um, and But you mean new revenue from new accounts or new revenue? No, 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 no. Basically current year's revenue minus last year's revenue. Okay. So okay. revenue added. Um, okay. And that could be from existing customers as well. Um, and so the end result is is some number and the number that we like to see for companies that aren't profitable, because once they are profitable, there is no burn, it's not relevant. But for companies that are not profitable, I think uh, a, like a minimum of, of 0.5 uh, trending towards one, meaning for every dollar you're burning, you're generating a minimum of 50 cents of, of new revenue up to a dollar of new revenue. Um, and if, if, if that trend is increasing, that, that suggests a, uh, increasing efficiency basically. So I, I think that's kind of the, the catch all metric for burn, but, um, we look at, we actually look at even more specific metrics around certain like e efficiency levels for, um, certain divisions within, within the company. So we'll look at sales and marketing efficiency as one example. So for every dollar you invest in sales and marketing, so people and non-people, um, how, how much of new new sales are you generating? And uh, that metric can range anywhere from two to three to one. So for every dollar into sales and marketing, you're generating you know three dollars of new annual revenue. Um, that would suggest a highly efficient and attractive sales and marketing uh, function. Okay, interesting. So lastly, uh, Brandon, I would like to know about the new fund that you have just launched, uh, what it is about, and uh, um, you know where are you with that? Right. So I, I referenced a little bit of this earlier around how historically we've had this single LP model with, with Providence as, as our single LP. And uh, moving forward, what, what we're going to do is basically just kind of replicate and scale that. So we're, we're going to to bring, you know, that level of, of engagement, of strategic engagement that we've had with Providence, we want to bring that to a select few other strategic organizations, you know, health systems okay. or, or, or integrated delivery networks. So so we're going to have a small handful of other strategic LPs with, with Providence as an anchor. You know, they're, they're still going to be a partner of ours, a big one. Um, and we're going to replicate Kind of our success and the the end re the reason we're doing that is by having a uh diversified lp base um you have more customer access for your companies um right. and you have you have a an audience because we have a network of other health systems beyond this providence and other payers but they're not investors in us and so they have a you know they, they don't have uh they're not they're not you know they don't have this kind of captive attention because they have a financial interest and a vested interest in our success. But by expanding your LP base and diversifying that, that captive interest increases. So that's naturally just attractive for companies. And it allows Providence, you know, to spread capital risk. And they're not the only ones on the hook for, for actually investing capital. Um, but the other reason, the other dynamic is in addition to diversifying the LP base, 
Um, historically, we've been like legally a part of Providence. Now we'll be outside of Providence. We'll be a spun out entity. We'll be an independent, uh, like legally speaking, just an independent venture capital firm. Providence will be a large LP. Um, and it'll give us more flexibility. It'll enable us to move faster and um, operate the you know the way the way we've always wanted to operate, and that's better better for us and our companies, obviously, but also better for the LPs um, because we're we're less onerous on on like their resources and their operations. Um, so so that that'll be the changes moving forward, and we're we're thrilled to make it happen. I think the one the one important point though to make is uh, what won't change is our investment strategy. You know we're still investing in companies that are you know solving the top pain points for the stakeholders that we care about for our lp base we're uh we're still investing in a similar stage uh our our check sizes will be somewhat similar uh, we're the same team and our existing portfolio is still there and um i i think the only the only difference is just more flexibility and enhancement we're like basically taking the best of the former Providence Ventures and combining that with just a, a better, more scalable platform. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And uh, would you also foresee the, like one of the themes that I've seen with some of the uh, firms nowadays is, you know, also sub segmenting or going super niched into some uh, moonshot areas like oncology or cardiac or um, uh, like uh, uh, rehab or you know like different or hospital at home so any particular theme so are you also planning to take any particular themes in near future or would it remain a bit more general uh across the board yeah it's a good question i mean um so, so we'll we'll do what we've always done which is we will our our areas of interest whether it's you know you mentioned the hospital at home and other other thesis areas our thesis areas will be driven by the priorities of the stakeholders we care about. And so when you think about those stakeholders, it's like I said, it's payers, it's providers, it's self-insured employers and even pharma um, with like a special focus on our LP base, um, as you'd imagine. And so when you look at the top priorities for those stakeholders, some of the investable categories that have come from that, just to give you some, some tangible examples, is um you know providers want to pro providers have a severe staffing shortage issue you know the, the finding finding doctors and nurses and retaining them um is pain points one through five for hospitals right. and so companies uh, new 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 you know uh, early stage growth stage companies that come in that help with those issues that m maybe they're helping recruiting and retaining or maybe they are uh, optimizing existing labor forces so that you know the, the same nurse can do more and more without getting burnt out, of course. And maybe AI is in there to help kind of streamline administrative burdens. Um, you know, workforce and labor optimization is, a, is an area of interest for us. Um, other things, uh, when you think of both providers and payers, engaging the consumer is of increasing interest. It's a very competitive market. You have these new entrants like, you know, Amazon buying one medical. You have Optum and United being the biggest employer of doctors in the country. So you have these like new market entrants that are stealing local share from the traditional care providers. And so finding solutions that help engage the consumer and build that more continuous and modern relationship is always of interest to us. Um, and then I'll, I'll give you one last example, behavior health. Behavioral health has, has been a buzzword for a long time, but the issue that it has had for a long time is who's going to pay for it. And a lot of that has changed now, you know, because of COVID, behavioral health has come into increasing right. focus as a crisis across the board, particularly for um, specific populations like adolescents and, 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 and children, um, right. behavioral health issues. Um, you know, specialty areas like substance use disorder, or um, one last one is, is autism uh, and ABA therapy. A lot of these uh, behavior health has been kind of deconstructed into discrete categories because of how much it's being emphasized. So 
So we'll continue to look at things like that. All, every, everyone needs behavior help, you know, hospitals, payers, employers. It's a multi-stakeholder need. So it's an attractive investment area. Sure. Okay. Okay. That gives uh, some great insights. Uh, so thank you, Brandon. I think this has been really good. And uh, you thank touched you. upon some of the very important aspects of uh, building health, which is something we always look into, um, you know, for the podcast. And uh, I believe it, it really um, opens the doors of imagination for many of the founders tuning in. Thank you so much, Brandon. Have yeah, you got day. it. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us on the Health Tech with Purpose podcast. Before you leave, make sure to like and subscribe on Spotify, Apple and YouTube. And if you would like to see someone on this podcast, do refer to us. My contact details are in the description. Before I leave, I wish you stay healthy, stay curious and keep building.